thanks everyone for joining. Uh, very excited to have with us uh, Dave Ferrucci uh, today. Uh, as many of you might know, Dave was the founder of IBM Watson. IBM Watson was one of the first displays of artificial intelligence, and it really helped society believe uh, and understand that, hey, AI is here to stay and it can actually leave the labs and help, help them with their practical applications. Recently, we've been overwhelmed with the promise of deep learning, and I just wanted to talk about that a little bit. I mean, uh, machine learning or deep learning in particular is a fascinating and, and critical technology that has made tremendous advances recently. Um, machine learning is of these modest roots, uh, actually, in, in, in regression, which is, you know, I have, like, for example, two data sets, height and weight, and I want to be able to predict someone's away from their height or vice versa. I may have a bunch of data points and I want to abstract all those data points because there's sort of noise and there are anomalies, the whole distribution of possible values. And I want to, I want to come up with a simple way to express that relationship. I might just find the, the line that separates, um, you know, some of the data points from the others. And that, that relationship allows me to abstract or have an understanding of what the relationship is between height and weight in that population. I could add other um, I could add other variables, like for example, heart rate, and I could look at this as a multi uh, uh, a multiple regression, still linear, but now instead of a line, I'm looking at this hyperplane. But you can imagine if I add hundreds, if not thousands, of dimensions, it becomes an, a very complex problem. And nonetheless, if I can solve it, I can have this abstract function that will allow me to predict, uh, you know, some of the variables from from the others. What happens with um, with, with neural networks, these are amazing devices because what, what we've learned how to do with them is to efficiently learn how to find functions, not just linear functions, as we just saw, but even more complex functions that can separate even more complex multiple dimensional spaces, not just with a simple, simple linear function, but even with a non-linear function, it means more complex. So they're relatively simple. Um, we can, you know, take them and replicate them. I could add that you have these notion of hidden layers. So we bring the input in, that might be a bunch of values. We have these hit, hidden layers, the values flow through the network. More layers I put in, you could think of it as relating to the complexity of the function that I can find. So where um, you have linear regression, maybe separating um, some of your data points with a line, as you flow the input through the neural network, I can get combinations that ultimately result in a new function that is not linear, but in fact, very complex. And as the diagram indicates, a lot more accurate. In this case, where I was almost exactly able to separate the red from the blue dots with this much more complex function. This is, of course, a non-linear function. So these neural networks are very general. I can feed this data in. I could ask humans to tell, you know, to tell us what's right or what's wrong, or I could use what's called the truth to label the data and then let the machine do its work and find you know, these more complex functions um, that uh, represent an understanding, if you will, of the space. And they're very general. I think you're representing images by representing the, the input becomes sort of the color value of every pixel in an image. Um, I could do this with voice. I could do this with economic data. I could do this with game data, like in the case of um, Go. Um, and so areas like voice recognition and image recognition and, and economic predictions and weather predictions and being able to predict moves in, in complex games have fallen to the power of, of, of these you know, incredible devices. So are we sort of stuck with the proverbial black box and that you know, data coming in, answers coming out, there's some complex neural network in between that really is building some model that is inexplicable, if you will, to me. And ultimately, if I have to ask why and how, and if I want to engage in the, in the underlying reason, I can't quite, I can't quite get there. And so, pure machine learning approaches have given rise to some real concerns. Um, so, while they're powering our future in many ways, they're also raising this question: Is what role do we do they play in critical decision making? And how do we shape and limit them when they play that role? And this is actually taken from the European ethic, uh, ethics guidelines for trustworthy AI, 
But in industry, we're also seeing in healthcare, in finance, uh, in, in, uh, in, in, in other areas, in, in uh, legal, people are asking, well, wait a second, if I can't, if even if it's right, some good percentage of the time, if I can't ask why and I can't engage in underlying thinking, how do I take responsibility for the decisions that are being made? Now, in some cases you can, but not in all cases. And this is raising and it's becoming more and more obvious that in more cases than we might have originally imagined, people are struggling with, wait a second, I need to be responsible for that decision. It's gonna affect my patients, it's gonna affect my clients, it's gonna affect society, industry. I need to be able to um, justify and rationalize. So the notion of agency, of transparency, decisions made by the software should be understood and traced by human beings. Explicability, humans should be able to explain the decisions their systems make. Ultimately, fairness, diversity, non-discrimination, systems should not be biased in any way. And of course, depending on how the data was annotated, it, machine learning will project or amplify those biases. So real concerns have been raised about how we architect AI systems regard to this problem. Now, when we go all the way back to Watson, um, this is uh, going to be 10 years ago now, there was this area, this area called um, uh, open domain, there's a typo there, but it's called open domain natural language question answering. Um, existed before Watson, uh, and, and there was a tremendous amount of, um, of energy and interest in it because it, if you could read some text or you could you know, read the internet and then take some arbitrarily formulated question and answer it accurately, that would mean you're making progress in, in natural language processing or natural language understanding at some level. And the best AI cannot come close to competing with human ch uh, champions at Jeopardy because Jeopardy was an open domain question, so could ask about anything. Not only that, but they asked the questions in sort of unique ways and novel ways that weren't often re uh, repeated or, or similar in, in regular language. So the AI at the time lacked the language processing abilities, the QA, question answering precision, accuracy, confidence estimation, um, to re and speed to actually compete. It was thought well beyond the state of the art. Con confidence estimation was very important because if you guessed at an answer and got it wrong, it had to be, the, guessed at an answer, you had to put it in your top position you buzzed it and got it wrong, you would lose the dollar value associated with that question. So being able to predict whether or not you had the right answer was, the, was, a, was a clear and important challenge in, in, in the Jeopardy case. Just to kind of get a sense of um, how to measure, think about what the competition was, or in some sense, what the, what the task was, this is a diagram. What I'm plotting on the diagram is um, actual Jeopardy games. These are Jeopardy games played with sort of the top, I forgot what it is, like top winners, if you will. Um, local champions. And um, and what I'm plotting along the x-axis is the number of questions that they were um, quick enough and confident enough to decide to buzz in and answer. And then along the y-axis, I'm um, plotting how many of those they actually got right, their 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 precision, if you will. And so, um, and that was your, 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 your average winner. The green dots are Ken Jennings. Ken Jennings, the all-time champion, proved again recently how great he is. He was re really an outlier. Um, on average, he was confident enough and fast enough to acquire 61% of the questions in the game, um, way more than sort of the 45% the that you see in the center of the cloud. And um, he did remarkably well on that. He did somewhere around, you know, 80 or 90, uh, 80, uh, high 80s or 90% um, uh, accuracy or, uh, on, the, on those questions he selected. Um, so really an outlier in the game. You can see how his cloud is whole shifted over and, and, uh, and up. When you took a state-of-the-art question answering system around 2007, it would plot what we call this confidence curve, which is if it, if it ranked all the questions, but it thought it, you know, it, it got it right or not, um, and you looked at the top 5% and thought it did really well at, it got about 47% right. As it had to answer more and more, it sort of got worse and worse. Uh, you'd expect that because its confidence was going down. But even here, you see sort of its confidence fluctuating. So it wasn't a very good confidence estimation curve. And then if it had to answer 60 or 70 percent of the game, it was only doing about 13 percent right. You can't even get you can't even get in the ring. Um, it was like silly uh, to even even try with that type of performance. So this was considered a very hard problem given the state of the art at the time. 
um, if you really did this well, you, the, the more, the, the less you chose to answer, meaning your most confident ones, you do better on that. As you had to answer questions you were less confident, you would do, you would, would go down. So um, a team of, of AI scientists and, at, and engineers at IBM Research broke new ground, accomplishing a feat considered impossible at the time. Uh, we engineered hundreds of NLP features, performed thousands of machine learning experiments, and developed the new architectures, new algorithms to build Watson. Watson ultimately did beat the best human champions at the high accuracy open domain natural language questioning game of Jeopardy. And in fact, you could you could sort of see the progression of uh, of our system over over that period. Ultimately, um, you'll see we eventually started to flip the um, the shape of our confidence curve, which we got good at predicting whether or not we would get an answer right or wrong. And um, and ultimately, we're sort of crossing the winner's cloud here where if we were fast enough now to answer, um, we would we would be competitive with Ken Jennings, you know, right in this area over here. And in fact, um, uh, we, we, we ultimately won, but it was not a slam dunk. Um, we were, you know, we were, had about a 70% uh, uh, chance or so of, of, of winning. Luckily we did win, uh, otherwise I might not be talking to you today. That's amazing. Uh, they really appreciate, uh, I, I know we're a um, few minutes over time, uh, really appreciate everyone dialing into this fascinating, fascinating talk um, uh, that covered um, and, uh, how, you know, covered natural language understanding. What are the new things that are possible uh, using AI? Uh, Dave, really appreciate uh, you making the time uh, and walking us through um, your, your um, new inventions uh, with, with elemental cognition. Uh, so thank you, everyone. And thanks, Dave. Um, uh, have a great week. You bet. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye. Have a good day.